Kia ora koutou. Thank you for joining us this evening for this um, community Q&A session with Whakaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. I'm Prudence Walker, I'm the Chief Executive of Disabled Persons Assembly of New Zealand and happy to be assisting Whaikaha in facilitating this session tonight. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Peter Allen to lead us in karakia. Mm, kia ora, um, Prudence. Ati hei maudi ora. Ati me tuatahi i te nei poa, e maumahara mātou ki a rātou, a kua ngaro ki te poa, um, ki Gabriel. <coughs> ka apiti hono tātai hono, uh, te honga mate ki te honga mate. A ka apiti hono tātai hono, te honga ora ki te honga ora. A ki a koutou, ngā tangata whaikaha, me ngā tangata whaikaha Māori, i roto i tēnei uh, wā pauri. Uh, nō reira, he mihi, he aroha, he manaki ki a koutou katoa. Uh, te, te kaupapa o tēnei poa, e, ko tahitanga. Engari te mea tuatahi, he aha te mea nui o tēnei ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. Uh, karakia tīmatanga mo te pō, uh, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mākina kina ki uta, kia mātara tara ki tai, e hi ake ana te atakura, he teo, he huka, he hau hau, ti hei mauri ora. So there was a, just a, a quick paying of respects to those people who have lost their lives during Gabriel and another mihi and call out to those of you who are having uh, troubles at this time because of Gabriel. So we think of you. Uh, and then our uh, karakia for starting the night for our, for our hui, um, just uh, letting things uh, settle so that we can move on through the night. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, back to you, thanks Prudence. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, as I said before, welcome um, to this hui. I'm just going to let you know um, what to expect tonight. Um, and the first thing is that we will be recording this um, and uh, and the agenda for that <clears throat> uh, for this, sorry, is shortly we will hear a few comments from Paula to open us up and to introduce the people that she has here with her this evening. Uh, and then there's already been some questions that have been formulate, formulated that we'll start with, but you will also get opportunity to ask some questions that you may have. Um, so uh, depending on how many questions there are that you may have, we might not get to those all today, um, but as with the previous sessions that we've had, if you've attended any of those, uh, the team at Whaikaha will be looking into those and will um, communicate about the answers to any questions that we don't get to this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Paula. Uh, on this session with us. Uh, Nā mihi ki koe mātua, Peter, for your karakia and opening us so appropriately as usual. Uh, I ngā mana, i ngā reo rauranga te rama, tēnā koutou kato. Ko Paula Tesserero tōko ingoa, ko Takituranga Mahi, he tumawaki mō Whaikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. Talofa lava, ki orana, warm Pacific greetings, my name is Paula Tesserero. I'm the Chief Executive of Whaikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. I'm uh, currently seated. I'm wearing a black jacket with pink flowers on it. And I have a chunky silver chain around my neck. I have short brown hair. And I'm sitting next to two colleagues that I'll introduce you to in a moment, and I'm sitting uh, in front of a grey wall with a Whaikaha banner behind me. And my sign name is uh, Two Fists Moving um, as Bicycle Pedals. So welcome and thank you for joining us this evening uh, for what is still an incredibly difficult time for many in our communities that have been impacted by the cyclone and flooding. 
as Matua Peter said, there's been a tragic loss of life, and I want to acknowledge this. There are many loved ones who are still suffering. Ka oho toko ngako kiakwe. My thoughts are with you. Countless people have put in huge efforts during this crisis to keep disabled people and Fano safe. There's still a huge effort happening to connect and care for people in our communities. And we expect that this will continue for uh, months to come. I'm also aware of the many people supporting the recovery who are also dealing with their own cleanups and own uh, impacts of the cyclone. This evening is very much a check-in with you uh, for us to hear what's happening, what's working, and what we can do more. Today I'm joined by by Kaha's, uh, two of our Deputy Chief Executives. Uh, on my immediate right is Brian Coffey, who's the Acting Deputy Chief Executive for our Policy, Strategy and Partnerships Group. And to his right is Amanda Blickman, who uh, is the Deputy uh, Chief Executive for Operations and Service Design. And on screen, we're also joined by Mary Roberts, the manager of the Hawke's Bay NASC, who uh, has been working tirelessly on the ground in Hawke's Bay with others. So we've set ourselves up as a bit of a panel tonight. I'm very conscious that some of you may have been attending uh, the almost daily meetings that Brian has been having with um, the community groups with an open invitation, but this is just to complement that and talk a little bit more about the recovery. Together, the three of us will be happy to answer what questions we can directly, and importantly, we're, all, we're here to hear your thoughts. I'd like to say briefly uh, before we begin that I want to make sure we understand what is needed uh, for those who are still um, taking the, the toll of damage. I know that we'll all be feeling this for some time and many people right now are managing daily challenges on top of other challenges. As you know, this is only the third time in New Zealand's history that a national emergency has been declared. And it came at a time where I think we all felt 2023 was going to be the year that we could move on and, and get some other things done. So for our community already feeling isolated through the impacts of COVID, further disruptions to services, power cuts, loss of transport and other infrastructure impacts, uh, this has been a really stressful experience and we've been hearing that in our community engagement. Myself and the team at Faikaha are keenly aware that we need to make sure that the needs of disabled people and their families are front and centre in responding to a crisis. As a relatively small agency without a footprint in all of the regions, uh, our role has primarily been to support the lead agency, which is the National Emergency Management, or NEMA, or Civil Defence. Right throughout the emergency, we have provided them with direct input into making sure that things like communications are accessible, and we put one of our staff into um, during the floods in Auckland into an office uh, up there. We've been working with and supporting disability support service providers, NASCs and community organisations and NGOs who are supporting people on the ground. We've been having engagements with communities to hear directly what's been happening and trying to find solutions across government and within community for those people. We've been using all of our channels to communicate key disability specific information from other agencies. Another key piece of work that we were involved in <clears throat> is helping to develop the government's community support package. We wanted to make sure that there was a presence of the needs of disabled people being met in that fund. So we were really pleased to be able to make progress on that and to organize a community support package uh, for disabled people. Information on the government's community support package and how to access that uh, is available on MSD's 
website and we'll also put a link to that uh, up on the screen at the end of tonight's session. You may have issues and questions that we can't solve or provide answers immediately, but where we can't, the team will record those and come back to you. What we hear today will help us influence the ongoing response. We've spent a lot of time working in cross-government forums in the last few weeks to make sure that when housing are responding, when MSD are responding, when fire and emergency services are responding, when civil defence centres are being set up, we've been providing advice to ensure that as much as possible, the needs of disabled people are being met. And we've been making sure that we work with local people to be in some of those civil defence centres to ensure that the needs of disabled people can be met. So we'll take your insights tonight to inform both how we're responding right now, as well as thinking about how we get ahead of the next crisis that happens and have a well-developed plan across government um, for that. At the end of the session, we'll bring up a slide with some of the ways that people can get support, and I will ask Prudence at the end to run through that. Before I hand back to Prudence to take us through some of the questions that have already been sent in advance, I just invite my colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, kia ora koutou, nga mihi mahana kia koutou, or Brian Coffey takunga. Uh, so greetings to you all, I'm Brian Coffey. Um, as Paula said, I am the Acting Deputy Secretary for Policy Partnership and uh, my substantive role is the Director of Office for Disability Issues in Faikaha. So greetings to you all. I am um, six foot tall. I have much more grey hair than Paula on my left or Amanda on my right. Um, I'm wearing a business shirt, a checked business shirt, and I've got lots of notes in front of me and a big mihi out to all those people that are on the Zoom call who have actually been participating in some of the community meetings over the last few weeks. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko Amanda Blackman Toko Ingoa. I am the Deputy Chief Executive, uh, Operation Design and Delivery. Uh, I'm sitting next to Brian, Brian's on my left. Uh, I have medium blonde hair um, that's tied up in a ponytail. I'm wearing glasses and I'm wearing a pink dress. Thank you. Uh, kia ora uh, koutou katoa, ko Mary Roberts, toku ingoa. Um, so um, greetings everyone. Um, I'm Mary Roberts. Um, I'm the manager of NAS Corks Bay, um, which covers not just the disability NASC, but the older persons NASC and the mental health NASC as well across the Hawke's Bay region. Um, I am currently sitting um, in my home, which is in Waipawa in central Hawke's Bay. Um, I have um, a brunette hair, which is tied up in a clip. Um, I'm wearing glasses. Um, I have a silver necklace with an amber heart um, and a cream colored top over a, a blue dress. And welcome to everyone. I think we might have momentarily lost Prudence. I'm just checking. Uh, no, I'm here. I was just waiting for the screen to change. <laughs> Sorry, Prudence. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, I'm uh, currently attending the uh, seventh reg uh, Pacific Regional Conference on Disability and um, I've been sitting there as interest in interest yesterday in the opening session um, when some people to do with various parts of the UN um, were speaking about um, disaster responses. Um, and so uh, 
there's some great people to follow up with um, <laughs> on that. So that's really good. Um, and also just want to portray to everyone who is attending today from affected areas um, in recent times that um, there's much love being sent from other Pacific nations um, thinking about uh, what's been happening in New Zealand recently. So as I mentioned before, we do have some questions that we've pre-prepared um, and <clears throat> I'll uh, address those to the panel. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions that you want to ask, um, if it's more suitable for you to put those in the chat, please go ahead and do so um, and we will be watching out for those um, or after we have addressed the pre-prepared questions you are also able to raise your hand either physically or electronically uh, if you're able to do it electronically I'm probably going to notice those ones sooner but I will scroll, th scroll through for anyone who's raised their hand physically um, so some of the questions that we have the first one that I have here is what does the chief executive intend to do about support during emergencies for those with disability in rural areas and communities? Thanks, Prudence. It's Paula speaking. Uh, so firstly, I th just want to acknowledge again um, the providers, community groups, other organisations, families uh, who are supporting people on the ground. Uh, who during this recent period have done an incredible job in really challenging circumstances. You know, our role at Whaikaha, uh, you know, for the last few weeks has been working alongside and providing advice directly into emergency authorities, um, local representation, um, working closely with NEMA and making sure that information that is coming out about the emergency is in accessible formats. Now, that hasn't always happened. Um, and I think that, you know, teaches us some lessons for the future, but we've certainly been uh, encouraging, influencing, and um, trying to make sure that, that that happens. I'm hearing about the impacts uh, when infrastructure is down and maintaining health services and things that are critical and absolutely acknowledge that in rural communities that can be especially challenging. The impacts on infrastructure like transport, telecommunications, the isolation that that can create for disabled people poses much more risk um, than non-disabled people. And, you know, those messages are messages that we continue to push um, with and alongside other uh, government agencies. I think it's also worth emphasising that you know all agencies at the central and local level have to make sure that they are delivering on their obligations to disabled communities that they serve. So one of the things that we've been doing is trying to plug gaps where that hasn't happened or working with agencies to help them address those gaps and then we've also been keeping a log, if you like, of all gaps that we have observed during this crisis so that we can get ahead of and create a better framework for the future. Thanks, Paula. Um, so the next question we have is, what steps is Faikaha taking or planning for this year for a cross-government response to climate change uh, where disabled people are meaningfully included? Um, and, and how can disabled people with knowledge or lived experience and expertise in this area get involved? Got a prudence, Brian speaking. Um, so I'll answer this question and it really builds on um, Paula's response to the last question, because I guess the last few re weeks have really reminded us that um, climate change is a reality and the effects of climate change impact um, disproportionately on disabled people. So this is a really um, important issue 
for disabled people. Um, FICAHA has a role working with other government agencies, influencing policy from a disability perspective, and um, climate change is no, no different to that. So I think um, one of the things that we ought to do is um, get the names of people who want to inform policy change and we can make sure that um, there's the opportunity to do that, either by speaking to us and amplifying the voice to um, the agency that's leading climate change or the opportunity for people to be directly involved if they wish to. Thanks for that, Brian. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's a really great um, opportunity in all of the, the um, difficult times people are going through right now, but to influence the future um, and take some action in relation to that. <clears throat> um, now to the panel, uh, is there any flexibility or alternative that is in place for those who are on this, on special authority medication, uh, especially those who have only a day or two that they can manage without, so that we can be confident that we don't just keel over due to a medical technic technicality. Um, sorry, there's a bit to this. Um, is there any flexibility or, or alternative that's in place for those who are on special authority medication, especially for those, um, you know, who only have that day or two? Um, and what can, you know, obviously um, a lot of systems are impacted when these events happen. Um, so what can be done when people need medication urgently um, due to their supply um, and in those special authority situations. Uh, kia ora, Prudence, Amanda speaking. Um, I Amanda. will answer that question. Uh, so we uh, went and checked and um, have been advised that pharmacies can use their discretion um, when dispensing medication. Um, there is more avail information available on the Pharmac website, um, but uh, and we're happy to take any queries about that. Okay, yeah. Um, I wonder um, if if people might comment if they have an experience of that, because obviously being at the discretion of pharmacies, uh, people are not necessarily going to get a consistent approach are they um, but good to know uh, what what the official word there is um, so what's been done to support people through this time um, in the Hawke's Bay region in terms of making sure disabled people are being supported to get the help that they need on the ground um, but also uh, in response to potential social isolation um what what's been done there and, and what do you think you know needs to happen what have you heard uh kia ora. prudence amanda speaking uh i'll answer that question um so hopefully what paula mentioned earlier about our work with providers with nasks dpos and community groups was helpful um going to be very important as immediate and urgent needs are met. Uh, and we also uh, need to understand and acknowledge the incredible stress that many people are under and that this is height heightened by the isolation uh, many people will be feeling under the normal circumstances. Uh, so we welcome, I welcome thoughts and suggestions and initiatives uh, from this group and other groups. Um, we will be talking to our network of providers and NASCs uh, who have already been reaching out to those at risk uh, and uh, about addressing uh, social isolation as well. Um, and this is also happening through local people and groups. As previously mentioned, um, people can ring or text the disability line 24 hours a day uh, and seven days a week. There's also a wellbeing line um, for people who are experiencing social isolation that they can call and text. 
Uh, and I encourage you to contact the Faikaha team if this is not helping. Um, we will uh, share all these contact details at the end of the session. Uh, and we have received a suggestion that Faikaha develop a social isolation strategy for emergency events. Uh, we think that's a great idea and we are looking into this. Um, so it's important to note uh, that Faikaha isn't an on-the-ground ministry in every community with capacity to go door-to-door. -door. Um, however, the providers and groups we work with have done a fantastic job uh, looking after those most at risk. Um, I, I'd like to just come in there, Prudence, if that's okay as well. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, and I, I absolutely know that there's such a huge community spirit um, here in Hawke's Bay. Um, there's a, a very good um, disability community. Um, we have a regular hui um, uh, on that, which involves as many people as possible. Um, uh, and there is such strength out there and so many good ideas, I think, that, that we're going to have from this. Um, and to have all of those suggestions would just be so valuable for the way forward. Um, but honestly, in, in Hawke's Bay, the community spirit out there is absolutely amazing. Um, and my, my teams are out on the ground and working with providers and with people. Um, and they have been absolutely um, overwhelmed with the, with the whole um, uh, input from anyone and everyone. But of course, there are many rural areas in Hawke's Bay, um, and um, those are the ones that are very difficult. So social isolation is a huge problem. Um, and can I just clarify that NASC stands for Needs Assessment and Service Coordination. I've just seen a question come up. So that's Needs Assessment Service Coordination. But of course, we can only reach out to those people that we know about who um, have public funded services. Um, there are a lot of people who don't um, fit into that. So I think there are a lot of hidden people. So the more people have a voice, the better for us all to actually um, take this forward. Thanks for that, Mary. And so I have one more of the, the pre-organized questions and then we'll get on to some of the questions that you've all posted in the chat or if you would like to ask those yourself. Um, and the last one is what supports need to be put in place and how can we get the fund, right funding to the right areas? Um, so in this case, especially Hawke's Bay, Northland and other areas are affected by the cyclones um, to help with the rebuild in the disability sector. So I guess that's, um, you know, about some of uh, the, the stuff that disabled people along with everybody else need access to, but also um, about some disability specific supports um, individuals or the community need in rebuilding after these events. Uh, thanks Prudence, it's Paula speaking. Um, so there's a, a few uh, ways to respond to that. <laughs> Firstly, as I think we've sort of, we've emphasized, we, we really um, have worked incredibly closely with um, providers and NASCs um, for those disabled people and families who receive disability supports and that's obviously a, a portion of disabled people in our communities and so what we um, are really trying to do as an agency is make sure that we are amplifying voices across government so that the needs of all disabled people affected uh, are taken into account so we've done that through these various forums that we've been contributing to, working closely with, with NEMA and closely with those organisations who are directly um, responding to things on the ground and making sure that through the community support package that we were part of shaping and, and developing, um, that there's funding uh, not only for providers, um, but also for disabled people through community organizations. So we hope that 
um, you know, in, in that way, we can ensure that funding gets to uh, those, those places. And, you know, we've done uh, outreach calling um, through both the floods and the, the cyclones. Uh, and we've really, uh, and we've put some staff um, and hired some people on the ground in some of the affected areas, just so that we're getting that on the ground intel back and can help to um, push resources that way. Um, sometimes those resources have been things as practical as a generator or a sat phone, uh, and other times it's been uh, linking people up in civil defence centres and things. So really played a, a sort of a multiple um, number of roles and making sure that through all of that, that we're trying to do our best to direct resource um, to where it where it best goes. And then I think there's a, a bigger answer to that question, which is actually about, right, so longer term as we, as New Zealand rebuilds the affected parts of our country, um, we as an agency absolutely have a responsibility to be inputting into cabinet papers and policy decisions and things that are made that um, have the potential to impact uh, all disabled people in those communities and so we have already had some input into papers and we'll continue to do that. Kia ora, thanks for that Paula. Um, now you did just touch on um, the next question that I have from um, one of the people participating today but I just wanted to delve a little bit further because it's something that I've been thinking about myself in terms of emergency preparedness um, and that is around has there been communications to um, places that provide disabled people with funding that if need be and if possible they can use their fund how they can use their funding flexibly in this time so for example um, purchasing a generator to be able to charge power chairs or other equipment that's needed can we just delve into that a little bit more uh, so it's Amanda speaking, Kira Prudence. I'll respond to that. Um, so um, in the immediate response, we were making sure that uh, things like generators were available um, so that people weren't able to, uh, weren't having to use disability support funding. Um, and where we were hearing that there were difficulties in accessing things like generators, we were making sure um, that they were available and um, particularly to providers um, things like uh, generators or satellite phones. Uh, in terms of the disability support funding that's already allocated, um, there is already um, quite a bit of flexibility through the purchasing guidelines for people who have individualised funding or care support, for example. Um, we have had some feedback that people have wanted um, assistance with uh, things like care support claiming. Uh, and we've been working uh, to make that uh, the payments much quicker, um, but also providing assistance uh, uh, so that people aren't having to even fill the forms in. So we are we continue um, to be really open and receptive to feedback about how you know the things that we could do to make things easier for people. Uh, and the care support um, was one of those examples. Maybe just another one to add, sort of building on Amanda's comments is. One of the things that we um, sort of naturally expected and saw was uh, people's equipment being, disability-related equipment being damaged and needing replacement or repairs and things. And, um, you know, we thankfully able to, to work with and ensure adequate funding for um, our equipment providers. And, and that's you know, for, for any disabled person uh, to to apply for. So, you know, we, we expected that to happen and wanted to make sure that we uh, were putting those supports in place and making sure that people knew how to, to get access to that. Thanks for that, Amanda and Paula. Um, I've got another question from the chat and then I see at least a couple of hands up. So I will go to those after this. Um, so somebody who mentions that they have a daughter who has very high needs asks, 
Um, the cyclone has been very stressful. Does Whaikaha have anything in place for disabled people if we can't depend on civil defence since they're already so busy? Uh, so it's Amanda speaking, Prudence. Um, I, I'll answer that, but it, yep. Brian might add. Um, so some of the outreach, the purpose of the outreach calling was to check that people were okay and um, that, that there was contact made, but also if there were things that people needed. And so we were getting feedback um, around the types of things um, that people needed locally, and we were supporting either the NASCs or providers to get that in place. Are you going to? Yeah. Something? <clears throat> the thing that I was going to add, Prudence, was um, the message we've been give, giving, and it's the right one, is um, the emergency response in terms of evacuation and those sorts of processes must be done through civil defence and emergency services. Um, and then that the disability support is there uh, after that. But um, I think we put everyone at risk, many people at risk, if in fact, we try to do the role that um, emergency services um, are best placed to do. Yeah, sure. So if I'm hearing you correctly there, you're sort of talking about being able to influence uh, civil defence, for example, and those emergency responses, uh, but not creating something uh, alongside or in addition to. Correct. Thanks for that, Amanda and Brian. Um, now, I see we will go to somebody who has their hand up, and I'm just scrolling back through. Uh, Rachel Cuthbertson. Just fake. Kia ora, Rachel. I'm in Dunedin and I'm a disabled person who, for my sins, used to work in emergency management in Wellington City Council. I wonder whether there is a way in which better information can be gathered from um, the people that various agencies support who have disabilities regarding their frailties, whether it is a high dependence upon specific medications or whether they have a power chair and therefore have a requirement for generators, et cetera, like that. Because I know that uh, the emergency response centres have plans for areas that are at high at risk of flood, et cetera, and other various um, sort of weaknesses within the sort of um, general areas around them. And you're saying that they're the people that should have the repository of all the information for these things. Is there any sort of way in which when NASC funding has been approved on an ongoing fashion, there's a requirement that information comes back from those people with the NASC funding to provide information on the vulnerable people that they're supporting so that that could be fed back through to the local emergency management offices? Because I don't think enough information has been held by the emergency management officers currently regarding disabled people and their vulnerabilities. Uh, Amanda speaking, uh, I'll answer some of that question. So um, there is a centralised list um, that is held through Te Whata Ora um, of people who have um, electric wheelchairs and may need generators um, and um, <clears throat> we understand that people also have access or will have uh, manual wheelchairs um, so there's th there's um, that information available and um, in terms of uh, people who may need extra support or are more vulnerable the disability NASCs do collect that information and uh, they have uh, contact lists of what they would do in an emergency uh, and the Te Whata Ora NASCs also have that. I don't know if Mary wants to add um, or make any additional comment. Yes, it, 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 it's Mary here. Thank you, Amanda. Yes, just to reinforce what, what you've said, we, we um, the NASC in Hawke's Bay is actually managed under Te Whata Ora. 
um, and we have very strong li uh, links and lots of, of sharing of information and um, um, trying to make sure that gaps are, are filled, you know, so, so, so that, that actually occurs all the time. Um, I think there's always room for improvement um, uh, and communication is always one of the things that we need to, to, to get better at. Um, but certainly there are there are strong contingency plans in place as to what what would what happens in these emergencies um, and, and I think we're we're learning more and more each time um, but certainly we are continually feeding information up and sideways and wherever and, and getting feedback back down again I appreciate that it's uh large amorphous mass of groups and people and that the information will be patchy um, but just from my personal experience with the two agencies who support me um, I suspect in a lot of regards if I wasn't quite so stroppy and outspoken I'd get <laughs> good on it yeah given the cold so to speak so um I'm just wondering if there's a better way of doing that. And I know that these things are evolving, mm. but maybe if we could get ahead of the disasters rather than reacting to them, that would be useful too. Uh, yeah. I think we all absolutely agree with you, Rachel. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. Right. Um, Eleanor, I know that you've been waiting a while. So uh, now is your time. Go ahead with your questions. We'll just get you on screen with. There we are. Sure. Um, I'm from Whangarahi in Tautukuru, out north here. Um, I've got a few things, even though I've probably repeated myself in the whole week. But um, I've got, um, is there an opportunity for somebody like myself to have direct contact with the people um, that are in our rural areas, that are in our community? Because what I'm saying is a lot of people contact me. I don't belong to anything. Um, but because none of the agencies work after five. None of the agencies work on the weekend. They need someone to contact. And this is what I'm trying to say is I'm prepared to, you know, I mean, you know, it's all authority, but I would love to see our Taitukurei region have a database where someone in Taitukurei can ring around and check if these people are okay. Because just funny enough that I got a phone call from my last team telling me that, They've heard from Whaikaha and how great I am on the Iropi that they need to catch up with my nets. Why does it need to take something like that for them to get their job organised? They're doing that for me. What about everyone else that they're not filling in the gaps for? And this is hard. So I'm just thinking in Taitukurau, it feels like we left out, even though I'm attending these hobbies, but the Jay Blogs up there and the Carol Browns and the public don't actually know what's going on until they hear it from somebody and our providers aren't telling us if you know what I mean I mean we've got people in uh, Rafati that have got no power people up to Hokiang have got no power um well there's a lot of stuff going on it's just what does it take to become an opportunity with Whaikaha to have someone in our region to provide a service like this so we can have a database so we can contact our people take the pressure off you guys or something like that. We want to look after our own as well, if you know what that means. You know, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, well, I've got my own, own motto, but organisations aren't always that well for us to save people up here. I'm not sure what it's like anywhere else, but you can't always rely on organisations. I mean, it only happened to be that they contacted me through me being in Whaikaha on the Rupi. That's why, if I wasn't involved, they still wouldn't contact me. So we need people, roots from the people that actually live with the disabilities in Taitukurau, that actually need to talk to the disabled in Taitukurau. Because the problem is that, don't get me wrong, I'm not racist, but a lot of able-bodied people are telling us what to do and we're getting fed up because they don't put themselves in our shoes. They don't live our life. I've had to, personally, i got a bed um, given... Oh, but without the rails, what's the point of a bed without the rails? They do not understand because this is an able body business. And this is the thing is, I'm disabled wanting to teach the young disabled what I know, you know? And 
we need to start something. And unfortunately, this flood in this cyclone woke me up to a lot of agencies and organisations in Taitokiro. You know, who's there at the end of the day? You know, who's been there for the people? Not the agencies. You know, they're nine to five. They don't do weekends. So I'm prepared to, you know, I mean, I'm not putting myself out there, but contract a whakaha. Give me all the names. I'll ring everyone up, see if they're okay. Because no one's doing that. Thank yes. you, Eleanor. Thanks, Eleanor. It's, it's Paula. Hey, Paula, just before you go to that, it just it's a slightly different question, but I think I'll just put this other question out there as well because maybe you can address both those things in it. Um, and that was from someone, how can we help government start developing robust, robust emergency management for disabled people? So I guess both of those things are about the role of community in these responses. Sorry, back to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Prudence. Um, and, and thanks, Eleanor, for, for sharing your um, experience. And, and thank you for the help that you're clearly providing people I think it, you know it can it can um, while we all want to help in our communities at that local level we want to make sure that um, there are not individuals who who have to take on a, a, a responsibility that um, becomes quite difficult when you're you know managing your own impacts of of the weather I think one of the challenges we've all had is um, given the the severe impacts on communications and infrastructure and things, getting communication out about things in the usual way was particularly at the start quite challenging. Um, as days moved on, it got a bit better. So I think, you know, what I would certainly say is I think there's a few things, um, Eleanor, and this is not a complete answer, but just sort of, you know, at the top of my head, sort of thinking about making sure that where people are contacting people in community that you know the 0800 disability line can be accessed because actually then they can take care of some of that coordination of things and making sure that the right information you know for that particular person has been um is being provided um and then I think also uh, we'll we'll just do some thinking here as well around um because we've been talking just this week about um, to what extent we can just help a bit more on the ground through putting some people in to just help coordinate some of those things so it's not up to you know particular individuals. I think that wider point, which is the question you sort of introduced, Prudence, is you know, one of the things that um, you know this has really, I, I guess, reinforced for me is that New Zealand needs to have an emergency response framework that at all of the relevant levels includes disability um, information and a disability lens on everything. So one of the things that we'll be doing um, after this is just starting to talk across agencies about what would it take to bring that together? What are other agencies going, you know, what, what will be the follow-up all of government response to how you develop a national framework and our input into that in partnership with the community because we need that on the ground feeding in. What is a national approach to responding to emergencies for disabled people look like? Because you know that <laughs> this is not the first and it certainly won't be the last. So we need to get ahead of it. Yeah, I absolutely. Think Thanks, Paula. Oh, Brian, you were yeah, no, Alan. Eleanor, you've provided great input through this process, and so that's really been appreciated um, in the time that you've taken. I think the, the thing that we've learned is really um, what works well, or what's worked really well over the last few weeks, is actually having that disability presence at the emergency management centres. So they're there to back up the very important things that those frontline people are doing in terms of the disability response. So that's, I think, I think what we're learning is that's got to be common practice and usual practice and everyone needs to be ready for it when an emergency comes that we're able to do that. Um, we cannot 
um, rely on great people like you, Alan War, right across the country. Um, so then, so if we can't do that, if we can't have Eleanor everywhere, we have to have a systems approach through organisations. Mm -hmm. That's the safest way. Yeah. I think just building on that, it's Paula speaking, um, you know, I think as I sort of said at the start, that we, um, because we're really conscious that there's, there's not a sort of a... Um, disability embedded response um, throughout the country we we have you know gone into NEMA we've gone to civil defense we've had staff in the relevant bunkers and things coordinating and offering advice but it would be nice in the future if we we sort of had that immediate response and we didn't have to sort of do it as we went along um, now NEMA and civil defense and things have been incredibly responsive to um, to our advice and help and, and things, but it would be good if, you know, emergency services and others um, and other agencies dealing with the, any emergency already had that disability response embedded into their own practices. So yeah. lots to do. Thank you for that. Um, you have touched on some of the questions that have been asked in the chat, and I am mindful of time, um, <clears throat> although this is a really important conversation. Um, so I am going to ask a couple of more questions before we wrap up. Um, a while back, uh, somebody had asked, oops, just scrolling up. Um, Somebody had asked, are you consolidating this information into accessible emergency info, a booklet or videos and things like that? Has there been thought given there? Uh, it's Paula speaking. Um, yes. So the um, one of the things we talked about at the very start was um, how do you package all this information together and make it available in accessible formats when in an emergency situation, the information keeps changing? Um, so we talked about that a little bit at the start. Um, and so our comms team here have done a really great job at um, working with those who are putting out information to really encourage them to put them in accessible formats. And then I think if the question is about the information we have been talking about being made accessible, um, then the, the answer is yes. Thank you. Um, now we've got, I'm going to go to one more question. I realize that there are some questions that we haven't answered. So as with um, previous hui that we've had, the chat will remain open for 15 minutes after we end. So you're free to type your questions in the chat and those will be answered. Um, and Paikaha will make those uh, the answers available um, in the coming days. Um, so the question that I'm going to ask is the last one is what if a person with autism or some other impairment that impacts this ability um, cannot go to emergency shelters. Where do they go? Uh, Kira Prudence, it's Amanda speaking. Um, I think that uh, what's what you're highlighting or what we have seen is um, the need for planning um, ahead of an emergency and so that people are well prepared know what they will do um, in advance. And I think mm. it just it um, highlights what Paul has just said around um, getting information, having an emergency plan, um, knowing what to do and who to contact. And of course, it depends on the emergency. Um, so I won't answer specific to what does somebody um, with autism do, um, but I would say that there needs to be um, plans in place and some um, a, a level of people know having a plan in place around what they will do and so will that be an expectation of um where people are supported by disability service providers going forward yeah so that's a good question too i mean it's yeah. it's really going to depend on an individual's um situation and um what's going to work best for them yeah okay 
Thank you for that and for all of the questions. Um, as I say, the chat will remain open. Um, so before I hand it over to Paula for her final comments, I'd just like to get up on the screen um, the emergency num or the, the vital numbers um, that we have, just in case people don't have those. Um, but these will be available on various websites as well, or feel free to just take a photo of it if you've got your phone handy um, as well or a screenshot. Um, I will read these out and hopefully somebody will also be putting them in the chat um, as I'm speaking. Um, so just some ways to get support. Uh, the Disability Helpline is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they can connect you to information and support you might be needing um, at any time. So you can call 0800 11 or text 8988. Uh, you can also use the New Zealand Relay Service to call them, of course. Um, work and income may be able to help with funding for disabled people in their whanau, um, and you can get in touch with them by calling 0800 559 009. Um, and if you're in Wairua or Hawke's Bay and need food, bedding, clothes, or have lost income, uh, call 0800 400 100. Um, if you are deaf or hearing impaired or otherwise find it difficult to communicate on the phone, um, you can email msd underscore deaf underscore services at msd.govt.nz. And we have another slide. Um, if you just need to talk to someone um, to, to get through the things that you're dealing with at the moment, you can free call or text 1737 any time for support from a trained counsellor. Um, and to get in touch with Faikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People, um, as we've mentioned, um, you can contact them 8.30 till 5 on weekdays uh, or email contact at faikaha, that's W-H-A-I-K-A-H-A dot G-O-V-T dot N-Z, or you can call 0800 566 601 or text 4206. Um, now, of course, if it's an emergency, um, you can call 111. Thank you for that. I hope people who have needed to have got a chance to take those down or um, get them from the chat, uh, but they are also available in a different form on Faikaha's website. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Paula for any closing comments that you may have before we go to Peter for Karakia. Uh, Namahi Prudence, thank you for facilitating this session, doing, a, as always, a great job. Uh, just thanks to um, my team, uh, Brian and Amanda and, and others involved in um, bringing this session uh, together. Um, to Mary, thank you for being on the ground and all that hard work you're doing and being being part of the team responding tonight. Um, I, you know, sort of seven or so months into the establishment of Faikaha when we're, you know, building our organisation and things, um, you know, an emergency like this never strikes at the right time, but it's been in, in in an interesting way, it's been a really useful time uh, to help us inform um, some of our priorities. And it's also meant that we've really had to get across government quite quickly to ensure that the needs of disabled people across government um, have been you know, front and centre. And so that, that's been a, a positive, if you like. And I, I saw Leone's comment um, pop up uh, just around um, something around if we if we um, stick at this this work, 
um, you know, it will be better for disabled people. And, and that really resonated um, that that's right. We have a opportunity here like we do from any crisis or, or uh, emergency situation to actually think about how things could look different in the future. And this should be something that community, Faikaha and other agencies are working on together. So um, I've already had a very, very initial conversation about the need uh, to do this both internally and, and with our minister. And uh, we'll be working with other agencies um, as we get through the next few weeks to think about how we can pull that together. So nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Uh, thank you everyone for making the time. Thank you all for all the hard work you're doing in there in the community and supporting disabled people and, and our families. And I will hand to you, Matua Peter, uh, to close us out with karakia. Awesome. Uh, kia ora, Paula. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all of your team's efforts as well. So I'll fuck a toki before I close with Karakia. Uh, we'll summarise all of these things that we've just talked about, and especially the planning perspective. So me mahi tahi tato mo to orango te katoa, which indicates that, you know, we work as one for the good of all. And to do that before a event arrives is the best option. Uh, everybody.